I was introducing, I was just waiting for that clock to hit uh, seven because I didn't want to lie to somebody and have them, you know, come in at like the last minute and go, Jesus Christ, I missed the first film. <laughs> Okay. But hey, this Don't is a rush. great starting place. Uh, I'm Brent Johnson. I'm president of the Historical Association here. And we've got Catherine Cassidy. She is going to be showing us some old pictures. And the whole idea is for you guys to say, oh, hey, here's a question. I know about that or something like that. We want to get everyone engaged in this as we go. So we'll see how it goes. But for one thing's for sure, we're going to have a, uh, some good pictures. So yes. Take her away, Kathy. We've been really lucky. Um, so, welcome everybody. Um, this is a 1929 map of Kasimov. And I, I apologize it's not um, better. Here's a copy that uh, can pass around. Um, but this was in uh, about 1927, 1928. The Alaska Road Commission um, built the first road in Kasila from the cannery. That's the site of the original cannery that was first built in 1882. Um, they, the, the federal government built a road that the locals requested so the, that they do so. They built a road seven miles from the cannery up kind of along K Beach today. And it ended up at uh, the homestead that was originally the Coles and is now George Pollard's. Um, and how many know where that is? It's just um, up on the uh, hill, uh, the hill on the other side of the uh, mercantile, thank you. Hey, there's a seat up here if you like. By <laughs> um, and when this map was, was put together by the Alaska Road Commission, they, they uh, also um, uh, platted out where the where the homesteads were that had already been um, acquired by people, and they were fox farmers in those days. And um, where's the map? Carol, now borrow it for a minute. I'm having a stress memory problem. So. Um, Pete Madsen was right here. So Coho now, Coho Road goes over there. The uh, bridge, the bridge goes across in here. Um, and we are, and we are right here. Right here. Um, so Pete Madsen was up there. He had a fox farm. Um, the Victor Home Place is right there next to a gust nest. Um, J.A. Nylander was there. He was a, um, one of the local uh, skilled log builders. Um, Al Hardy was here. And Billy Williamson was right next to them there. And there was John Sandwick and Pete Jensen and the Crockers. And we're going to be um, seeing something of the Crockers in a minute. And this was the, what was the Coles homestead and is now Pollard's place. So point out McLean's, you went by oh, that sorry. One. This is the McLean homestead off the beaten path. It was, so you notice most of them are on the river because the river was the road. That's, that's Casilla 101. It, it was all about, the water was the highway. And for the McLean's to, um, to, select that spot. It seems a little odd to me, but they were very successful. So. And down, the first post office in Kasilov was down here um, at Hardy's place. Actually, the Williamsons, who had this homestead, first put it in, and that's going to be our next photo. Yeah, I've forgotten how to operate my computer. Okay. <laughs> Just a little nervous. Okay. So, in 1923, this photo was taken down on the river. So this is where what we call Old Kasilov Landing is today, um, where Trujillo's fish processing plant has been for uh, a long time. That's, that's the bank. This is a spot on the river 
that it's the first place as you come up river that you can get close to shore from the river without a lot of uh, mud flats and, and wetlands in between. So this was uh, the spot just up river from here that the Williamsons selected their um, spot to homestead and build a fox farm and this was the landing. So you can see the, the skiffs off to the left um, and that became the first official post office. And the campers there are presumably a group of hunters um, uh, staging there before going up river uh, on a, a big game hunt. Um, in the 30s, this is what that spot looked like, looking upriver this time. Uh, I don't know if that's the same building that was the post office building, but now the, the Hardy Homestead had been um, purchased by Heine Berger, who had a freight company in Cook Inlet and, and between Cook Inlet and Seattle as well. And he built the dock. But backing up a little bit, we'll go back to... Uh, we mentioned, uh, we mentioned the Crocker homestead. Well, Slim Cop Crocker, as a young man, came here in 1925. Um, he spent a lot of time up on Tustamina Lake. He's in Andrew Bird's um, diary mentioned there. And um, he went back outside and then moved up in 1927 and became a big game guide, among other things. And this is Slim Crocker with a hunting party. This is 1931, and this hunting party, party is made up of uh, uh, Harry H. Webb, a na national famous po polo player and sportsman, and his uh, nine-year-old son, you can see in the skiff there, and his wife, and various other hangers-on, and they had come from uh, Long Island. So they had taken a railroad across country to Seattle and hopped on a, a Alaska steamship and came up to Seward, took the railroad up to Anchorage, and probably that, maybe that boat we saw in the previous picture to come from Anchorage down here to the Kasilov River. And now they're getting ready to go up the river um, on a hunting trip and they came, they ended up with, there's a report here, oh, the uh, Harry, Harry Webb Sr., quote, knocked over, this is a newspaper article, knocked over two bears, a prize ram, and one of the biggest bull moose bagged on the peninsula this season, the antlers having a spread of more than 60 inches. Um, and, Slim Crocker stayed on here, and Brent knows a whole lot more about his... Oh, I was just going to add on a little teeny bit. <clears throat> uh, a lot of you have heard of Betty Crocker, and of course, uh, she was born right here in Kasilov. That's Slim Crocker's daughter. They, they were twins, Bill and Betty. They were both born here, by the way. But uh, Betty is interesting uh, for some of our histories because she uh, was raised here in Kasilov, went to Australia, where her mother was from, <coughs> came back, and uh, she was a, gave uh, care to Wade Jakinski, who had uh, uh, mental health, uh, I think she had Alzheimer's. Parkinson's or Alzheimer's, that's the one, yeah. And uh, then after that, she went to work for my sister and mom, and uh, worked there for several years, so uh, it's kind of funny how history sometimes circles back on itself. She's back in Australia now, last time I talked to her. So here are... Yeah, there's a, oh, sorry. So <laughs> a little space over here. And they can, uh, fill in, and they can uh, uh, So here are photos from the Crocker collection. And, and I'll, uh, ones that people are interested in, I can uh, blow up. So they're slim. <laughs> Slim Crocker, probably in the 1920s, this is up on Tustamina Lake at Tom O'Dale's Lodge, and I believe this is Andrew Bird's big dog. And 
and there are a lot of hunting pictures. So these these photos came from Betty, um, Betty Crocker. Uh, this one was taken in, in Kenai. This is a George Brown um, and quote a native uh, hauling firewood. That's uh, uh, iconic for the 1920s. This was a photo labeled uh, trapping cabin in timber. And I don't know, um, Gary, is this one of the, the trapping cabins that you uh, located up in the hills of Tuscamina? Uh, yes, it is. It was quite a ways off the lake. Yeah, this is. And uh, where was it? Uh, it's on the North Shore. Where, where about was it? Um, is you're looking. One? You're looking at it to the right, right hand side of the photograph. Um, right about in there. You can't see it in the photo, okay. but it's just about someplace in there. Oh, I, I meant like where on the, where is on the lake? So it was a trapping cabin. Uh, this side of uh, Ace of Pine Creek. Okay. Um. So we don't have a plan. You know, as you, you, uh, if anybody has an interest in seeing hunting photos or, or um, here's a, the classic boat that was used on the lake in the river, skinny. And this is Slim Cracker here, taking the, uh, uh, I don't know if these are, uh, if this is a hunting party or just some locals. Uh, you know the year of that picture? In a fur collar. 20s. Or, in, you know, well, let's see. It could be, could be early 30s. The, the, uh, what, what, so ladies, what do you think those hats are? 20s or 30s? Okay. Um, so that was, uh, um, I don't know the plane. It's a pontoon plane. When Slim was in the early 30s, when Slim was uh, uh, guiding hunts, he worked for the Alaska Guides Association, and they they would uh, take their clients up to Tustamina Lake by boat usually, but sometimes by plane. And they also had a hunting camp up uh, north, up around Rainy Pass. They fly their clients up there. Um, this looks like a Dunk Little, maybe as a camp cook. So there we are again. Uh, this is interesting because it shows you what the Tustamina Lake Country was like in the 20s and 30s, uh, as in contrast to the full-grown spruce that we've that we've all been familiar with in uh, the last few decades. Uh, there are a lot of, in all these collections, there are a lot of photos of trophies and often typically unknown, unnamed hunters. There's a nine-year-old Harry Webb with well, possibly his uh, his own trophy. There's Mrs. Webb with her Wolverine. And this is <coughs> Slim and his wife. Do you remember her name, Brent? Alice. Alice with um, Betty. And that's that was their cabin, and um, I don't know. Does anybody remember whatever became was that their cabin? Where uh, was it? Crocker's uh, cabin. Who's, uh, that's Larry's. That's Larry's okay, house. Okay. The, the logs look too small to me there. Okay. Me too. I, I don't know if that is. Uh, you know. <clears throat> that's not all bad. I know is that Larry's house is Crocker's cabin. Right. But that. 
Maybe this was his brother's cabin. The logs look too small to be. Yeah. Larry, you're talking about Larry Myers. Larry, Larry Myers, Myers. yeah. yeah. Oh. And that's sat uh, down below Evenson's place, yeah? Yes. Down below Irv and... So is that actually the Williamson homestead then? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not the Williamson's, no. Where was, was it originally? Um, yeah, we go back to that original <laughs> map. <laughs> so the Crocker... We were just trying to figure this out the other day. Where so it the Crocker's or the... The Crocker cabin, where was it originally? It would have been... Um, it was, uh, come on. Oh, here, up here, and then, um, um, so this and the ridge okay. is down okay. here. So that so was Evenson's that they were bought from yes. Yes. Well, the original places, right? Evenson's oh. the original. Yeah, I believe Evenson's bought. Who did Evenson's buy from, Captain? Uh, sand, not Fellers. Did Fellers buy out Sandwings and Evenson's bought out Fellers? No. Okay, uh, Fellers were think, further. I meant for a second here. You might be right. They're all. Yeah, uh, maybe you're right. Really I think but, so. But, but, but uh, it's odd though because <clears throat> Evenson's didn't have Wayne Fellers' house. Yeah. Oh. Because that's down Sandwick, and they're they're not there. Wayne Feller's house is still down there. Yes. Okay. Yep. Uh, Wayne I, Feller's house is um, John Sandwick's house. Okay. <laughs> okay. And is that the one that has up in the front of that house? There's like some type of a cement thing on the ground. But when you dig the weeds away, it's there, and there it almost looks like a mason sign. I, I can't tell you that. Okay. I do know that Wayne Fellers poured cement under John Sandwick's house. I can tell you that much. So that's a clue, but I can't I can't go to the next step and say that for sure. In history, we run into all kinds of, you think one thing is, and then it turns out not to be. Yeah. Say, so, Catherine, how hard is it to go back to that first picture you put up? Not is at it, all. Okay. The map? Yeah, run back to the map and show us what you just showed those folks where. Okay. Uh, Will do. Where Crocker's place is on that map. Okay. right below there. I bet you one, he probably homesteaded that, huh? Yes, and I had, uh, and I was thinking, yes, I Why was wouldn't confused. He? So, no, they are separate. So Crocker, but so where are Evenson's now? Evenson's ended up purchasing Crocker's. Yeah, right, but was it from Crocker's? We couldn't figure that part That's out. That's what you're asking. We know that they, I think Evenson's got yeah. this piece here. And, yeah, they got more than just that. And so, okay. and the uh, the orphanage got a piece of the trunk up here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, <laughs> okay. Okay. Where do we want to go? Where do we want to go? Um. So you. Uh, so we have an incredible collection from the McLean family um, that has been shared with us. And they have photos um, uh, from all many different decades. Um, this is the 19, uh, this is like 1930-ish. Um, this was the first inboard motorboat that was built that could travel up, up the Kasilov River. And it was used by the Alaska Guides Association. It's an odd-looking, bargy-looking boat. You can see the pitcher pump. 
that they have <laughs> for their bilge pumps. I love it. Is that a bilge pump? This is a bilge pump? What else could it possibly be? I don't know. Yeah, but you're not going to keep the kids occupied as long as I can. Um, stand there and that yes, oh, Carol, yeah. Carol just asked, uh, we have pictures of the first school, and uh, if uh, I'd be happy to go there since she spoke up and, and asked for it. So that is, uh, bear with me for a second. Um, So this, I think, um, the Ness is, okay, this is a photograph of the first Casilla schoolhouse. And um, this building is not at the museum. It still exists. This is a, um, a building that Larry Myers collected. It was mm -hmm. on the south side of Coho. It had belonged to um, one of the local fur farmers, Abe Erickson, and he donated it to the community to be used as a schoolhouse in 1932. Um, the territorial thing was they would the territory would supply money to pay a teacher and to purchase school supplies, uh, but the community had to come up with a building and housing for a teacher. And so Abe Erickson uh, donated this building. And, and the reason that that was, was because there wasn't enough kids to qualify for a full-blown school, oh. by the way. Do you remember how many were required? No, sorry. Yeah, 12. Yeah. I think it was 12 or 15, one of those two, and, and they were short of that number. Mm -hmm. So on the other side of the river was the uh, uh, Johansson Ness family with, one, two, three, well, with all of the kids here except for the three McLean children. Uh, so how many, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight or nine, um, the, the Nesses had um, uh, quite a family. And the schoolhouse was not far from their home on the um, other side of the river. And Enid McLean was the teacher, and they, if you remember the map, they were on this side of the river, kind of inland. They were the one homestead not built on the river. Enid, because uh, there was no bridge, there was no road, and and uh, Edith couldn't go back and forth to the school with her kids every day, so she'd go and spend the week there and go home on the weekends, um, crossing the river with her kids and um, taking all uh, the supplies and doing all her chores over the weekend. And um, it, uh, she did not remember it as a very fond time in her life. <laughs> so let's see more. Carol, is that is that what you were? Uh, well, yeah, I was wondering. Like, we don't have any old good old photos of the building, of the school building. Um, they have in the in this collection that came from Georgia Johansson. She had some cool photos of um, fish traps. Uh oh. Uh oh. <laughs> Keep on, squeezing. Please. 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 Please.
So the first cannery was built in Kisilov in at the mouth of the Kisilov River in 1882, and then uh, a few years later, uh, canneries on the west coast here imported this uh, fish trap technology from the Great Lakes. Brent, now now it's your turn to describe how that maybe works. Sure. Please, thank you. Fish always go with the tide. And so the, as the, when the tide is in, the fish are going to come in here, and they're going to follow this baby out, and they are going to work their way out. I'm not exactly sure how, those, no. how that part is, but anyway, out here, there's a little area where they go in to this uh, to the part of the trap here, and they're too stupid to get back out, so they just swim around there endlessly in a circle until uh, at slack tide they come up with a uh, boat and you saw them brailing them out. There's okay, we'll, a, we'll go back to that. A giant net that's underneath yeah. and they pull up the net. And yeah, so here, this, this trap is, is not fishing right now. It's open. You can see that all this dark stuff out here is seine web that I believe if the trap was fishing, it would be down in the water, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. Okay. So when we go back to the uh, Johansson's. Okay. So now... This, these photos are taken out at the far end of that trap that we saw, where the, the uh, salmon had followed the, followed the fence out and, and gotten, ended up trapped at the very end. And here is a tender boat from the cannery. And here's a little barge that probably, maybe the, the tender dragged it out or maybe they left it there, but the, um, the fishermen are Using go, go Brett. <laughs> go Brett. What's that? <laughs> take, 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 tell us what's happening here. Oh, sure. They're, uh, they've got this same web underneath, and they're going to draw that up to uh, get the fish in a ball. Then, they actually, I think they braille. Uh, well, they actually dump that. You're right, but they can't only really, uh, dump so many. And so, see, yeah, you see, go. they're brailing up a, a portion of them at a time. And and beyond, in here, I believe, is the fish hole that they're going to get dumped right into. So it's pretty um, complicated. A whole, a whole often they didn't have a boat quite that fancy, and they put them in scows. I was just asked uh, how many fish traps were in this area. That's a question. Sure. Uh, you know, it depends on the year, but uh, in the late 50s, there were about 55 traps up to... I think the most I ever counted was almost 80 in Cook Inlet, and almost all of these traps started at Nanilchik. There were only a, just a handful south of Nanilchik, and they all went up along this east beach as far as Boulder Point. There were a few scattered, you know, maybe five on Caligan Island at the most, a couple on the west side, uh, but almost all of them were right here on the east side beach. So what's, what, what the remnants are of the pilings are still on the Oh, absolutely. We still have them That's on cool. there. Cool. I yeah. was wondering. Yeah. Right. And, and so there's two kind of there's two kind of traps. If you look at these giant uh, um, pilings. pilings, this is almost surely a pile driven trap. And so here's the uh, quick little bit of history on that is the big canneries uh, would have a pile driver and they could afford to drive these piles. Uh, after the uh, territory of Alaska started running short on money, which is almost immediately, but later in the 40s, they figured out that they could make a bunch of money by charging more for pile-driven trap licenses. These were licensed by the territory, but permitted by the federal government. And so the territory started ratcheting up the price. I think the most I've seen for a pile-driven trap is like 3,500 bucks for a license per year. So as you can see, if you look at this in the mid-30s, it was about 50-50, maybe a few more uh, pile-driven traps. But when that price for getting a, a trap license went up that much, a, a hand trap was only 500 bucks a year. But a pile-driven trap was going to be 1,500 up to 3,000, 3,500, something like that. And so that really choked down the number of pile-driven traps and made people switch over to hand-driven. And the difference is, on a hand-driven trap, you stand the dang pilings up by hand, you drive an iron bar, a couple of them each side, uh, tidewards from this, and then you run a cable to the pole to keep it up. 
And so it's just a whole lot more work. But, and you set um, it up and take it down every year. Yeah, yeah, and of course they do. All of them came down every year. The ice would wipe these babies out. And there was a big, uh, quite a big uh, industry of cutting the trap poles in the winter and, and uh, piling some. Archie McLean was one, but lots and lots of people uh, made money by providing these poles, which all happened during the winter so that if early in the spring you're ready to go. And one of the interesting things about fish management and cooking, it, so this is something that will really uh, will sort of shock you. But when traps and set nets were the, were the game, uh, all of these traps, like this one here is pile driven, so it may go out a quarter mile or so, not very far. The only one that went out any distance was at Bluff Point off of uh, Homer. And, uh, you know, south of Homer, between Anchor Point and Homer, and it went out half a mile or so. But all the rest of them were very close to shore. The pile driven ones all were put in by hand where the tide went out to. Okay, so they were all very close to shore. And the set nets, which were scattered right from the very beginning in between these traps, none of them were out over, say, a quarter mile or so. And so when you see fish management today where we're all much further up ashore, that is recent uh, in, in the sense of history. That's after 1950 or so. Drifters started in 1947. There was uh, only a handful of drifters ever fished before 1947, so. Uh, but they, some of these first traps started right with the first cameras in the late 1880s. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And you can see how big they are, yeah. and that's just part of a load going up there. So you mm -hmm. can see conservation was really not much of a consideration. Yeah, I mean, but, but remember this. In the 50s, the traps were the bottom of the heap. Now, in, in cooking it only, yeah. and, and what I'm going to say is people are not going to believe this, but set nets outfish traps every single year for king salmon from excluding 1950, where the traps actually beat them, I think, in 1950. All through the 50s, set nets beat the traps on king salmon. Drifters beat the traps on sockeye just about every single year, starting again in about uh, 1950 when they really got in action. And the set nets often beat the drifters as well for sockeye. The, the drifters uh, were dang good pink catchers. I don't think anybody beat them on pink them. <laughs> <laughs> or, I mean, did I say the tra I meant the traps Tra were real good? Oh, oh, things I, oh no, you yeah. said okay, the drifters, yeah. Well, and the the very first piece of legislation that the state of Alaska passed that first year that we had our own legislature after um, territorial status, the first thing they did was outlaw the traps. Yeah, yeah, that's true, but. <laughs> Hey, got caveat there. So, we, in the statehood bill itself, the traps were outlawed. That was part of the statehood uh, act. However, the federal government didn't give management of the fisheries to the state of Alaska until 1960. Yeah. So, a lot of people think that the state of Alaska outlawed traps. That's not exactly true because they didn't have management. The federal government outlawed the traps in 1959, the year that we got them. The, the guy in charge outlawed them. Uh, it was actually a, a, a rush for everybody to take credit. The territory issued the license, and uh, Governor Egan refused to give them a license, so that kiboshed them. And plus, the secretary of whatever was over the fisheries, he also wouldn't give them. Uh, he, he closed it down for that year, so they were out of business any which way you look at it. But three months before the fishery opened, in 1959, the traps thought they were going fishing. So this happened very suddenly to those guys. So did they all convert over to set nets at that stage? There were already set nets in between the, there were already set nets in between all the traps and those set nets stayed in place. Nobody could uh, set net where a trap was until 1962. So the set nets were the uh, beneficiaries of this action that happened in 1959. They caught the fish that the traps would have caught, basically. Was there any kind of shift in population size in that, in that, in that period? Earlier you said that there was a little industry of people um, doing extra logging and stuff like that. So. Well, uh, as far as population, I mean, gosh, uh, Al would be more attuned to this. I was too young. I, I, I think the population after the war just continued to grow. When oil hit, it grew like a crazy person, and then people be, you know, more and more people went into fishing, but... Uh, but from the, from the very beginning, a lot of even the set nets were not local people. Oh, wow. they, 
know, they've always come the, up the with the traps were controlled. That was you're correct, and in, in, in the traps were largely yeah. controlled by yeah, out of state yeah. interests, by the canneries yeah. who were out of state, and and uh, okay. that was a, uh, a the big issue with the traps is who controlled them. Although keep in in mind that as of uh, 1959, when they were outlawed, I believe there were nine, I think it could have been eight, uh, independent trap owners that lived here locally, uh, Mrs. Wally, uh, oh gosh, I used to be able to rattle these off, uh, the guy down at Clam College, what's his name? Anyway, there were nine people that went out of business right with the other people, were never compensated yeah. one iota. Yeah. And there were always local set netters, and there were always local people like Nanilchik, uh, had a lot of people that operated the traps that were owned by other people. And so, you know, they just all of a sudden were like, oh, we don't have a job. This is a, a photo, <coughs> going back to the roads, road system. This was a photo taken when they were building that first road in the late 20s here. This is the crossing at Coal Creek. Now we have a a big, uh, what do you call it? The, uh, this is right up the road. Here. Now, Culver. 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 Culver, but you know, they filled it. They filled it in. Now there's a huge amount of snow there. Um, previously, the the little road went wiggled around upstream, away from the Kasilov River, to this little crossing here. Uh, and that's the camp of the the tent camp of the workers who were building the road. That, that picture does not do uh, the Cold Creek uh, Bridge justice at all. Uh, I, I was across this bridge, and so if you go past the airport and you go on around uh, that giant hill, it, it's actually in the bottom of a giant hill. I, are you I, sure this is? I, I don't believe that's Cold Creek. I'm very familiar with that crossing, and I oh, okay. there's just no way. No. I wonder if this is the Cold Creek crossing with the Sterling Highway. Was yes, I could, I could, I could agree with that. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. 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 Other it could be a different yeah. place in there. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so that there's a bank on Hold on. Yeah. What, what did you say? Yeah. 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 Oh. 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 Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Oh. 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 Um, but if it was, <laughs> so the, the rest of the story I would tell on the road building is that the grader, the road grader that's out in front of the museum now by the by K Beach, was brought to the Seeloff at the time to help construct that first seven miles of road in Seeloff in the mm -hmm. late twenties. Uh, they shipped it down uh, from Anchorage and. Uh, Al, um, the story on that is, you think that grader may come from the... I, this particular grader is not the one that I oh, was talking okay. about. Oh, okay. I have sure. pictures. Of, and when I was working for a road commission, I was a stop foreman, and I had orders to send somebody down to McLean's that when the road opened to where we could drive from Soldata to uh, Casillo, send somebody down to McLean's, and uh, pick up a road grader that belongs to the Alaska Road Commission that was left there in the 20s. So I sent somebody down and we brought it back and we refurbished it and we used it for a year or two. And I have pictures of it. Mm -hmm. And so, and then eventually they sold it to a homesteader in Casilo. I'm not too sure who, but they did. And this came from, uh, from a homesteader in Casilla, but it is not the same grader oh. because I have pictures of the one we brought back from the McLean's. Oh, so it's a very similar one. It's okay. an Adams leaning wheel grader, but uh, anyway. <laughs> and, and someone asked when it was, and so probably there was like something they called the tote road put in before the Sterling Highway. And, uh, you're, you're familiar with that, yeah, mm -hmm. Al? It, like in 47, 40, early 48 somewhere, there was a tote road that came. Uh, in about where the airport road is now? From the camp, right? I, No, 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 it came from Soldatna. Oh, I'm not familiar with that. Oh, wow. My, my memory goes to 48. Yeah. And we pushed the road down through in 48. Okay, I've just, I've just been reading the diary, and I've heard of this tote road before, so 
you know where uh, Pat and uh, Mary uh, McElroy's road is, mm -hmm. and that connects kind of, you can come on through this side. Mm -hmm. As I understand, there was a road called the Tote Road, and I just oh, ran across is. it. There still is a Tote Road there. Right, right. I, I, I'm not familiar with that. I don't know how that ties in. I, I just really don't. I just ran across it in a diary I was reading, and the diary was written in 48, so somebody from Kasilov went out the Tote Road, but they don't describe it. They just say they did it. And I've heard of that road before. I, I, I know of it, but I don't, I don't know how it ties in with the Sterling Highway. I really don't. <laughs> this was uh, this was the bus before all these roads got built. <laughs> We've got this all back in time again. Uh, this is, we're back in the McLean family collection, and I think this is on the Kasilov River. But this was a, a typical little boat that was used for uh, uh, would have had a gas engine. It was used for getting around in Cook Inlet. Um, uh, you know, all the way from Seldovia to Kenai and, and, and Anchorage. Um, well, that was the water taxi. That, that was the, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Look how much snugger that looks than, than the, uh, the uh, Crystal Bay dories that were so open. Well, they didn't have to work a net yeah. out of this one. Yeah. This was strictly for passengers and freight. And they didn't have to deal with sail. Yeah. And there's another one. Um, and it was a, a boat kind of like this that uh, Enid and Archie McLean uh, traveled up to Tuscany Lake on for a hunt in, in 1921 where they met and well, it was, they ended up um, getting married and moving back to Kisilov. There's another, they're, they're not very beautiful. No, but very functional. It was pretty impressive, though. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think they had to drag it up the casino. Yeah, and here we are. Did somebody... What was the mechanism with the dragon? How did they drag it up here? Walk up the river. It does say Stevak on that boat. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm going to find the picture. Um, where my glasses go? Um, we have a picture of a, a little boat being necked, being uh, dragged up the river. In the bird boat. Yeah, this is it. Yeah, there you go. So, yeah. And sometimes they have to be in the river, you know, just deep. <laughs> No, no, no. We got it. No, no, no. And uh, so somebody, somebody would be in the boat, pushing off, pushing the boat offshore, pulling it to keep it from being just pulled right up on shore. And uh, it would take a couple days to get up to the lake, or, or, at, you know, at best. Trying to look for some people shots. I heard that from the guy in the stern. It's one of them say pet silver fox. Oh yeah, we've uh, we've done presentations on uh, fox farming, so I wasn't going to do much there. So, but in the 1920s, um, this was uh, um, Billy's wife. Billy Williamson's wife, I just forgot her. Um, Mickey. Mickey. They had a fox farm where that first post office, just up river from that first post office. And they were uh, uh, not from around here. Billy Williamson was Fred, the, the surveyor. Yeah, I don't he, know where he was from. Oh, okay. <clears throat> he, he came up here for the first time doing a, working for the feds, federal government, yeah, for sure. surveying Cook Inlet, and uh, and he and the superintendent of the Casilla Cannery hooked up, uh, and uh, I think the cannery manager provided uh, uh, 
investment money, they started Fox Farm right there on the river. And uh, they were successful. This photo was taken um, by a, a famous uh, Alaska photographer. What was his first name? Le Burl. Boy. Burl. Burl. Burl, thank Burl. you. Merle, thanks, Jim. Um, up at a Fox show. What's Fox his last name? LaVoy. LaVoy. Oh, thank you. So it says right there. LaVoy. <laughs> 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 um, oh, well, they have a, a, like a trade shows in Anchorage and, and, and the best prizes Fox and the Fox gets up there by boat to, in little cages for the shows and, and this photo was taken. Um, mm -hmm. Mickey's in her city, city clothes. Mm -hmm. do, do you have a picture of her husband? <clears throat> <clears throat> um, the only one I have, yeah. Uh, yeah never mind. Uh, so her husband was uh, one of the guys hired to do the Here surveying. Is. Here he is. Ah, there he is. Yeah. So this is the guy. If uh, if you walk out and you find yourself a section corner or a quarter corner that uh, is uh, covers this whole area from Homer to Kenai. This is the guy that set one heck of a lot of those. And, and they'll be stamped 1918, 1919, or 1920. And they're still out there. Lots and lots of them. Uh, there were actually a couple other guys, a guy named Dahlquist and, and uh, a few others. But this guy was in charge of a heck of a lot of those. And it's real interesting to me that he was surveying this whole Kenai Peninsula. And he, uh, after he did that survey, and then he settled right here in Kasila. For whatever reason, he must have thought this was the hot spot. But in 1929, they moved, uh, Mickey and Billy moved their fox farm up to the east end of Kenai Lake. And I don't know why, but I assume it was because from there they had um, railroad transportation to the bright lights of Seward and, um, and all the... It was easier to get supplies for their farm and easier to get their product out and, and all. But they moved right before the uh, fur farming crash. <clears throat> so three of these early uh, fox farmers, and there were only, how many did you say? There's like... Seven, eight. Seven, yeah, there are not very many of them. Three of them were with uh, him, and or, or he's one of them, and then two other on his survey crew were axemen. You know, they didn't have chainsaws in those days, so when they brush the survey trails, they did it with axes. One of them is Pete Jensen, and the very first picture you said was... Matson. Oh, Matson, yeah. Matson and Madsen. Uh, yeah, Jensen Madsen were both Jensen. were both on his crew. You didn't even know that? I huh? didn't know that. That's so cool. <laughs> yeah, well. And they all settled here. And when they did the... Uh, when they did the surveys, they made notes of the soil conditions as they went, because these guys had this great misconception that uh, the people that came after them were going to be farmers. Yeah. And so they were, the whole homesteading thing, all this was formed around the concept that people were going to be farmers. Yes? Do you have any clue of where they got their fox stock from, their breeding Minnesota stock? Minnesota and Michigan. And locally. Local, uh, from um, wild stock? They, they live trapped okay. every fox they could. That might be, Gary, is that why we don't have any fox here anymore? Fox, yeah. yeah. Um, and, and then there were some breeders around. There was one down in um, Anchor Point and okay. other places. W and, and I don't know where their original stock would have come from, but they supplied later comers to the industry. It was a real favorite way to do it for a lot of people. They had a little island, and they would that way not have fences. Alan Peterson and uh, Jenny Peterson had an island in uh, Tutka Bay, at the head of Tutka Bay, about 1919, yeah. somewhere in there. Yeah. So, oh, here, this anchorage. You can see the cages with the show foxes. There we go. Um, Mickey was kind of famous for hand taming um, a fox. Um, they, it was not typical. Um, there's Al Hardy and the dead moose up in the river. Uh, it was, uh, there was a, a note on the photo about it being a, uh, a poached moose. Um, let's see, 
Um, yeah, they. <laughs> well, uh, technically. Actually, you'd be surprised. And, uh, again, I was just reading a diary that was written in the 47, 48, 49 period, and the folks that went hunting that lived here in Kasilov actually hunted for days to get a moose in in the moose hunting season. Mm -hmm. They frequently would come back. No moose today. No moose today. No luck. <laughs> I was just looking for more uh, fox farming photos. Um, so, let's see. Do you have any of the uh, Denina people that were here? Um, the only, there are very few, and we have, I, I just have accessible here one from that. Uh, so you're talking kind of early on. This is one. Oh, wow. This is from um, uh, the uh, uh, University of Alaska Fairbanks. And this was a family photo taken. Uh, they, there was a, um, in, in the 1880s, there was a village, native, uh, Denina village, uh, near Humpy Point, so south of the river, and one north of the river at, um, um, Cal well, what what's now known as Kalifornski, the old village site up there. I've seen um, evidence of uh, some back across the road here, like on the Cook Inlet native land back there. Oh, you're talking about like Barabras? Yeah, there yeah, they're, all, they're all They're over, all over. We got they're they're some on my homestead. Yeah, or, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so the village. both of these villages were um, abandoned after the flu epidemic in the 19, uh, 18, 18, 18, 19, oh, wow. 17, 18. Yeah. yeah, there was only three people that survived at the Cathedral Springs yeah. that survived the flu epidemic and they moved to Kenai, and that was the end of that village. Mm -hmm. So this photo is taken um, probably 1890, around there. Um, wow. by the um, superintendent of the Kasilov Cannery. And you can see there, there uh, you know, the Russians had been in Kasilov for 100 years by then. So you can see these uh, Deninas have adopted Western dress. The, their house is still traditional. When you see the, uh, what we call the Barabras, the holes, the uh, depressions in the ground, um, that's this is the structure. That's what it looked like. Yeah, this is the structure that would have been built above it. Although this one has a chimney right here. So was, was that their name, Humpy's? Um, or I always thought Humpy Point was named after the fish, but then that's well. Really, so the, yeah, this is close to Humpy Point. This so. is close to Humpy Point. So well, so probably some um, Americans or white people started calling them Humpy because of where they live. You know, yeah. I, 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 the, I the, don't, the fish don't are called Humpies humpy. because they have a hump. These guys are probably be called Humpies because they, they live near humpy, the yeah. white guys couldn't say whatever they could well be. Okay, yeah. I, I just. I never heard of the Humphreys family, that's why. <laughs> but check out the traditional, beautiful um, Vidarka, mm -hmm. the, uh, the, the kayak, the boat, the boat up on the boat frame that would have been covered with seal skin. Wow. And so they'd have a, a central home uh, called a Nichil, and, and, uh, and then they often had separate rooms built off. The, the main one, like this one is, and, and uh, I've heard that they were often used as saunas, and, and the uh, chimney in this one would uh, make that sensible. So, But it, traditionally, they would have had a hole in the roof and a central fire pit mm -hmm. in the building. I heard they used, uh, like, whale oil for lighting, and they used See? whale bones to yep. and whatever. the lining. Yeah. Whatever they could get, that Walmart was out of. <laughs> <laughs> when I was a little girl, we had banyas that were like that. Yeah, and that was in the 60s. Yeah. And Kina. That's cool. Yeah. And that's what, do you make staff me what do you make of this thing? A board that's washed up? They found or what the heck is that? It's like a blank. That's like a kind of broken blank. Be a speed of drying in the sun. It's like part of an airplane propeller. It does, but I thought not. No. <laughs> no. I have no idea. 
Um, yeah, wood or... It oh. might be a skin drying in the yeah. sun. Turn it at yes. an angle. Use it to mm -hmm. yeah. that off yeah. of a pipe or something, you know? Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I just wondered, like you say, it had a lot of uses probably. I just wondered where it came from because I would thought boards were a little bit scarce in that. Oh, yeah? <laughs> Here's a dog right there. Oh, yeah. I know you said that. Alan Boris has uh, uh, agreed to come and uh, give a presentation next month. We haven't said the date yet, but just to talk about the daily life of the Denina in this area. Uh, uh, I sure wish we had more pictures. So was the beluga whale one of their species that they had a regular harvest of? Well, I know that uh, that was typical in the Kenai River, so yeah. Okay. yeah. I don't know if they actually hunted them in the Kasilov River, but that was um, a, a, a local... Um, Traditional uh, harvest. Thank you, yeah. <laughs> okay, where should we go from here? That's the only... Uh, uh, well, let's, while we're here in this collection from the uh, University of Alaska at Fairbanks. Uh, um, this is in the year 1890. There were two canneries on the Kasilov River. There's the, uh, the original one at the mouth, and then there have been a second one built by George Hume upriver where the uh, inlet salmon dock is now, where the uh, um, uh, uh, Osmars dock was. And this was that location. Um, and these are photos from the superintendent of the, the uh, first cannery. There's a photo of it there. And that cannery wasn't operating this, this season because if you look up on the uh, wall there, uh, we have a little display about a shipwreck. And the ship you can see there was the Korea, and it was heading to the Kasilov River with all the supplies and crew to run the cannery for the season um, the South and hit the South Calvin Bar. Um, and it was, uh, they, they had no way to salvage the materials, you know, that everybody got off the ship all right, um, but, but the uh, insurance called the, the afraid a total loss and so the cannery couldn't operate. They had no way to get the canning tin and you know, the voluminous other supplies from, oh, the, the ship ended up. Um, on my fish site. On <laughs> friend of, well, thank you. Another great giant circle of history. It's still yeah. there. It's still there. It's still there. Parts of it. Well, yeah. actually. Um, yes, yes, where? Yes, the biggest chunk of it's down on my brother-in-law's yeah, fish. Brother <laughs> oh, okay, Keep it yeah. okay, here we go. This is on Brent's Beach. Yes. Yeah. So this is why Korea Creek got its name is because this thing came right into the mouth of Korea Creek. There's, there's a picture that uh, the cannery superintendent took of the this boat. Where, uh, I'm looking. Where, uh, uh, no relation. Where no relation. But at any rate, the, the cannery superintendent took a picture from this from out in the water looking back at the boat and looking at the mouth of Korea Creek, and so I went out uh, about, I don't know, 10 years ago and took the very same picture so that I could take a look, and one of the things that's different is you can see the oil rig on the shore. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, other than that, you see a lot more vegetation on the bank now than there was. Anymore. This was on, the, as you can see up here, um, this was, it, it first went aground on the Calgon Bar um, at 2 a.m., and uh, when the tide came back in, the, the story is uh, is in our display here, if anybody wants more details. Um, it floated, but it uh, it was sinking. Oh, Go back to that last picture. One which one? Quick. The one that's uh, on, the, on the bar, that one. Sorry, thank you. Come on. Okay. okay. Here's a real giveaway that you know you're on Caligan Island Bar. If you take a look, there's not a rock around. This is the stack of coal that they were unloading off the boat because when they were, went dry, they started heaving stuff overboard, hoping that they could get back afloat, but it didn't happen. 
But uh, then take a look at the other picture at Creek. Okay. Was that completely wind powered? The boat, sailboat? Completely wind powered. Yeah. The, wow. A number of these boats. Yeah, awesome. Okay, and this is the East Side wow. Beach, and you can just see the rocks. And there is bas basically no place I know of on the East Side Beach where you wouldn't see some rocks. Mm -hmm. And on Callaghan Bar, there are none. Mm -hmm. Wow. So, Caligan Bar is on Caligan Island? No, it's about five miles south of Caligan Island. It's a sneaky oh. son of a gun. It's really, uh, I feel really bad for Captain Wheeler that ran across this dang thing in the middle of the night. Okay. Five miles south. I, I had a great adventure story of crossing that bar one time when I didn't know it was there, but after I knew it was there, then it became much much easier. Yeah, surprise. Okay, so here, this is a picture that was taken on the on the beach at Korea Bend. And here's where Korea Creek runs out, right? That place right there. And that looks virtually the same here as it did in 1890, the same day. And here is uh, that year there, uh, the, this is what it looked like when they were building the traps and they had uh, so these guys are securing chicken wire, heavy-duty chicken wire, um, to form, turn this fencing into a, a literal uh, fence that would uh, force the fish to swim out towards deeper water. What? Um, it looks like a hand trap, doesn't it? That looks like a hand trap to me. Small, small mm -hmm. pilings. It, it's not, doesn't go out very far. I noticed that. So is that a hand trap or a? I bet it's a hand trap too. Okay. That oh. one looks like a pile trap. <laughs> we have differences of opinion. That's a hand trap. Oh. That's a hand trap because they're not right. It's amazing that the bottoms of those trap piles, that the last one that was existed was in, uh, driven in 1958 since no one yeah. drove, drove one in 1959. And you can uh, go out and look at them, and the wood is just as solid as could be that's broken off at the, you know, just sticking barely above the sand. It's There's hundreds bizarre. of them out there. Yeah. Yeah. So here's the, uh, the first Casile cannery looking um, from up, uh, up river. So it's, uh, you all know where Dipnet Point is. The, you can still see in the bank of the river upstream from the... Uh, the, the old city dock that's there, the, the bottom of these pilings are still sticking out of the mud mm -hmm. on the riverbank. And there's a, the water view. Oh, this is a pile driver. Uh, so can somebody tell us how it would have operated? <laughs> Okay. Well, I know some. I mean, they had some way of lifting a I mean, driver they, up, up through this within the scaffold, right? Yes, somebody's half. It's what? controlled with the anchors generally. You know, you get that thing in place by stringing some anchors off each side. And then, like you say, I don't know, they must have had, I'm pretty sure they were all steam operated that ran the hammer on them to pound the pilings. This early even? Yes, okay. absolutely. It wouldn't have been manual, okay. Mm -hmm. That's missing its uh, steam engine. And here, speaking of steam, here's the uh, an interior shot of that cannery. Yeah. And somebody, as you can see, it was, so there was a steam engine or two around <coughs> and, and this, what the here are steam these are steam pipes somebody who knows I have no idea okay well i think steam was right <coughs> through the building and and those would have been and there's a belt drive what up, yeah, up in the rafters belts belts, mm -hmm. belts that would have come down on that thing yeah and look at that lumber do you know which cannery building the, this one is, Catherine? Is this the one at Casilo? Yes. Oh, yeah. This is uh, Weatherby's. Mm -hmm. Oh, that was, we saw them. So, oh, so this was a crew. So, this is the same cannery from the outside. So, and uh, there's. Uh, it looks like it does. It looks like a fish wheel. Yeah, I wonder. Yeah. They had a uh, rail, uh, 
tracks for moving. They had no forklifts. No forklifts. So all that mill wood had to have been brought all the way up from the from Washington probably. So the the first cannery was built by a company out of San Francisco, mm -hmm. and they brought everything from San Francisco. Later on, the, it would come from um, the Seattle area, mm -hmm. and yeah, they were building the wood down there. And there's um, so the only thing that came from around here is the is the tree trunk that they used for filing. Oh, even those even generally those weren't big enough. They were usually imported. The hand ones came oh, from around tracks. here yeah, for yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. those. Yeah. Why not? Why did they bring it and put a mill up here? Was there just not enough construction to do it? We don't have the trees for it. They don't trees up there. And they, they were already set up with uh, uh, just tree size. Um, and what else? Some economics. Um, they already had the infrastructure down there. Down there, to do yeah. It. yeah. There were certainly mills here in the uh, late 40s. Yeah, this is the superintendent. Um, uh, Weatherby, who took these photos in his, he had a little frame house there in the cannery complex. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. I have a question. I'll show my ignorance and I apologize. The name, the spelling, uh, is that, I don't know the history. Is, there, is, it, is that a mistake or is that just a No, it's just. Uh, changed over time and if you find old documents sometimes it's KU it's this sometimes they have one S sometimes an A eventually when they got the post office that fixed it it's this okay. you know a lot of these Not are Russian these are Russian that. names in Kasilov it's, sure. yeah. it's uh, there's a couple of theories one is that it's somebody's a Russian's name you know with the sure. ending of off it's real common I've heard another theory that it's the uh, native word for cutting grass or something. Or tall grass. For, for tall grass. Um, uh, and that, that the, the theory there is that when the Russians showed up at the Kasilov River in 17 um, something, um, they asked the locals what the river was, and, and, and the, the Dinaida thought they were pointing to the grass that was all around the mouth of the river and, and so they told them tall grass. Okay. But that's just another story. We don't know. 1786. That's when the Thank Russians you. came to the yes. sea line. And sometimes it's just as simple as people try to spell something phonetically. Yeah, right. Oh, yes. Yeah. It has a lot of change. That's just spelling of Korea. You know why it's spelled with a C? Yep. When did it change? 1912? Well, that boat... Uh, was spelled with a C when it when it went aground in 1890. Now, why it's well, with a C instead of a K? Korea, the country was spelled with, with a K. C up until about oh. 1912. Oh, I didn't know and that. Supposedly, the Japanese, who were competitors with Korea, didn't like alphabetically Korea to come first, so they had to make a story. Today, the most Korean countries in the world have spelled the country Korea with a C. Most of them were Korea. If you look, if I look up old newspaper articles, I have to put Kasilov in various different ways, and then I can pull up articles out of, say, 1900 or late 1800s. Well, does anybody want to quit yet? It's Love Doll Collection, probably the 60s. No, Love Doll Collection. There's a, this is Abe Erickson. Uh, no, no, this is um, this is one of the local fox farmers, Abe Erickson. He built a cabin that's right next door to us here. And, and this cabin was a uh, trap cabin he built up uh, near where Slackwater is now on Casilo River up the lake. And this cabin, these planks, see it's not logged, these planks came from, came off of fish traps at the end of the season. Um, some of the companies would import tip, <coughs> these nice big, oh what, what are these, Tip Gary, two, three by tens, or these big, big honking timbers that they'd run around the top of the pilings. And uh, when they deconstructed the fish traps at the end of the season, the cannies would just discard those timbers. They would pull up, save the pilings, but discard these timbers, and of course, Smart locals gathered them up and built things with them. 
so Abe would have uh, hauled those up the river in a boat and built his little cabin. And that is uh, here at the museum, um, on the museum grounds today, that cabin that was uh, moved here by the uh, wildlife refuge. And it's very cool. Yeah, little cabin's right, my smokehouse is bigger than that. Did you have a picture of Ed Lovedall? Yes. Well, don't let me interrupt you. Go ahead. No, no, I'm. I'm the size of the dog. Yeah, pretty big, huh? You're, what was it? So here's Ed. Okay. As a young Who's man, that? there's Ed with his beaver hides. <laughs> <laughs> this was Abe Erickson's nephew, and he emigrated immigrated here. There he is, also. That's that's getting a little more more recent. That one. Yeah. Still. Um, okay. And this is the the cabin that Abe built that is that it's now here on the uh, you're so welcome at the museum site. Well, that might be a sign. Yeah. <laughs> that. Uh, Oh, okay. She had a bad back. What's the feeling? You guys want to watch some more? No. Yes, okay, please. Yeah. Was that you were in that one? I have some not head. When you get uh, when you get bored or your back starts to hurt, yes. Yeah. Chair back. Up up here. <laughs> oh, okay, they want their money worth. It's hard. But it's warming it up for you. Oh, hold on. I have, uh, the, the Russian uh, okay. graveyard at, at the north mouth with the wooden markers. Yeah. A little history on that. It's not Russian. It is, it has the graves. It's not Russian. It is not Russian. It is graves from uh, the, the cannery buried okay. workers okay. there. Wow. And, um, and uh, they worked them to death. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> um, no social security then. No, right. Seriously. Um, uh, so that was late 1800s? They're actually early 1900s. Oh. So the, the headboards are still down there. Uh, actually, we, we have the original headboards in the Washman cabin here, oh. and reproductions were made by Bud Crawford, one of our volunteers here. Thank you, Bud. Um, and what? And the reproductions are now down at the cemetery. It has a sign now, and little signs. It's uh, the the um, Totem Tracers Genealogical Group actually took on the project, okay. and then we we got involved too. Uh, no. Isn't there, is there some more graves there too that aren't marked? Um, supposedly, um, there were some supposedly some Chinese graves there yes. that. We've lost track of. Uh, <laughs> oh. there, there are plenty of graves not marked. In oh, yeah. fact, uh, my dad was hired to survey several cemeteries, and I, when, they, when we say my dad did it, that means that I did it. <laughs> but uh, it, you're, it's, it's an insane job. So you start, and you have a nice uh, cross in the ground, and you see the body goes this way, and so you can mark that all nicely. And then you'll find one where the cross is laying down, and there's moss growing on it, and the body's going which way. And then there's some that, you know, and so as a surveyor trying to figure this out, I'm, I was clueless. And so the ones that I could see, we marked, and the ones that we couldn't see, we pretended don't exist. This is one of my favorite photos. Um, can anybody figure out where it was taken? It'd be a cold creek or slew. Oh, a slew down down river. Did somebody Bud send likes a, cold creek, so. Did somebody send a Nilchik? Yeah. So that doesn't even look like it's a Way too many trees. It's not deep creek? No. No. <laughs> but I, this is just so, I just love this. It's, uh, uh, let's see. So you think it's Coal Creek running into Kazilov River? Yep. Okay. That couldn't be. But th this is, this was life. <laughs> you get to and from your boat taxi in a little skiff through the mud, whatever. You know? They're using me. <laughs> yeah. 
What's the say on the boat? Does it say Cold Creek on it? No, no. There's something on the back. Yeah, what's the name of the boat? Yeah, me and Trump. <laughs> and it doesn't get in my head much. What you do is you attend one of these meetings and they'll make it. Oh, well, that explains it all. <laughs> <laughs> Did you Dory? I love the Dory's. Yeah. Um, they, here, they, they're balls and spruce up with their uh, outboard. This was uh, 1933 or 33 or 34. Uh, this is uh, the um, party. Place. This cabin still exists at Old Kasilof Landing on the north side of the river where the park, new park unit is. And, uh, so this, this cabin here went from Party to Burger? To Burger, to Heinz Burger. To Hipsch. To Hipsch, to Trujillo. To Trujillo. <clears throat> to the state. To the state. Yeah. And it's still there. Uh, don't know where that beauty is. Mm -hmm. This is supposed to be the Coal Creek Bridge. Mm. Mm. Yeah, now you're talking, this looks a little yeah, more real to me. Because mm -hmm. the one side goes up to the airstrip, yeah. the other side goes over to Duncan. So. This is the McLean's Horse and Funny Wagon. <coughs> the Dale, does that uh, look possible? Yeah, it's, the bridge looks like it, but I don't know what this other structure is down there. I'm not sure I've seen the, that. Oh, that's the oh, the crick, oh, the bridge yeah, is going that, that the way. Oh, yeah. yeah, that could be it. Yeah, the um, the perspective there it, it makes the bridge look huge. Um, the perspective of the cameras. Yeah, I'm getting it now. Did they have any logging? It is trees. Camps? No, they did over on the other side of the peninsula uh, around the city. Oh. Don't know. Don't know what that building. Yeah. There weren't a whole lot of horses here um, because of the difficulty of keeping them fed. This is uh, from Fox. This is up on Tustamina. Um, that's Tom O'Dale and his dog team down there. I heard a lot of people went hungry here back then. Um, if they followed the moose season, this is Ed Lovedall, Brent. This is Ed Lovedall. Um, don't know what he did with his uh, with his babies. Um, his babies there. Hmm. I don't. Uh, this don't know exactly where that was. First part. Uh, <laughs> Who's truck? This is um, Pete Jensen's place. Mm. Mm. Don't know who's truck. There's a just a mishmash <coughs> in the. Um, this is Fox food. <coughs> they would cook uh, protein, fish, rat, hares, um, uh, probably illegal moose, with grains and and um, and then uh, put the mess into a. a Blazo can to freeze it, and then tip them out of the Blazo can and and keep them frozen. Mm. Good luck with that now. This this is no this is a um, cannery tin. Oh okay. <laughs> because and I, my theory is when the Korea wrecked, they had and so they used oh. to bring the cans the the tin up for the canneries in flat sheets that were about this thick, and. Wow. And then when the cannery, uh, when the ship wrecked, there is uh, suddenly a huge supply of nice sheet metal available for it's on, it's on gable ends of the old cabins here and roofs. And, and a couple of years ago, down by where the Korea wrecked, the tide washed the tide flats down and we found stacks of the can lids. You know, down there, they're all just and stacks of the tin uh, also, which is not quite yeah. as usable as it was today. No. Yeah. <laughs> it didn't wasn't preserved as well as the posts. The wood on the outside, the tins came with a, a wood skirt around it that was you know nailed together to protect the edge of the tins, and that wood was in perfect shape when I pulled it out. Mm -hmm. Nice. Incredible. That's McLean's original cabinet still there. Uh, oh. Now this, 
This is modern times. This is that same building, but um, Archie finally got a tractor. What kind of a car is that? Um, anybody know? Like a Bel Air. Somebody's splitting a lot of work. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's all I got no. <laughs> I love that one. I don't know. Yeah, I think it was posed. No, she was I think it was uh, more around or something. Who we got here? We've got um uh Party? Um no. This is uh isn't that a uh, love doll? Ed? This is um uh Huddle. Bob Huddle. Thank you, Jim. Bob Huddle. This is a, a guy, we have a book of for sale here with his journals and photos taken. He came up, he was a retired Marine. He came up to Alaska and, and ran into Tom O'Dale up at, at an up in Anchorage, and Tom offered to let him stay at his lodge up on Tuscamina Lake for a year, and he did, and, and uh, he took a lot of great photos. He probably took this one with his timer. He was a real photograph photographer. I don't know who this guy is, but that's Frenchie John Cannon. Frenchie oh, Cannon. so this is the guy that Hipsius bought their fish set from, this Cannon yeah. guy right there. Yep. Yeah. Can you show that last one again? The last picture? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. That one? Yeah. You know him? No, I was wondering <laughs> who that was. I don't know, but isn't it? Spooky. Isn't it spooky? It's like a real mountain man. Yeah, <laughs> I think it was. Uh, I'm looking at the shape of the sun. It's so different. They're so wide and rounded. I've seen all, all kinds. Um, there's a, on the river, the hats, 1930s again. Uh, now we've jumped decades. Here's the, uh, well. Building the casino off bridge, right? So it's, lo yes, looking south, right? Yeah. So were you, were you, hold on, were you there that year when they were building the bridge, yeah. Al? Mm -hmm. A guy named Billardu was in charge of it. Billard? Billardu. Billardu. Mm -hmm. hmm. So was this the pile driver they used for the bridge? I, actually, I didn't get down there. Oh, okay. They had already driven the piling when I was down there, so the pile okay. driver was gone, so I'm not sure, but I, I, I believe it probably was, yeah. Right. Fall of 1948. Yeah. Um, and this is the uh, that first Kasilov Road. You can see the, the leaning wheel grader. It's being towed by a Al. What kind of tractor? It's a Holt tractor. A Holt tractor. I don't remember what what model? Twenty probably. That diesel? I you know I don't know. The Holt that, was a bit before my time. Probably gas. I bet. I think it was gas. But I, I'm not sure. Hardly any trees. Yeah, hardly any trees. This is which road? This was the original Kasilov Road. This this photo is taken somewhere around the the Kasilov Airport down here. And this photo is taken about 1928, 1929. 27, 28. Yes. Okay. Yeah. The road was finished in 29, so. So probably 28, 27. And I think this was a camp by the Kasilov Bridge. That was a Kasilov Bridge camp when they Thank put the bridge in. Yes. Okay. So, and I don't know who these guys are, but there's a classic. Bunch of Yahoo. Yeah. And they have, uh, they've been sheep hunting. Nice. Oh, here we go. This is, uh, oh, wow. this is a, another professional Merle Lavoy photo. So this is a glacier up, up to the south, southeast. Jim, southeast of Tuscamina Glacier? Oh, that it looks like uh, Dingle's yeah, really, Glacier. Truly? Oh, okay. We're probably it? half gone by now. So it, is. That. Oh, it is. Clear John Trail. Trail. Yeah. So, what year? I don't know what year this was. <clears throat> Wait a minute, did this say? Six. No. Here is uh, the McLean's Fox Farm. Um, Joan had written, so uh, there's this, the, there are individual pens for, there are pens for individual foxes. They're totally surrounded by a guard fence. 
Um, and it was it was a giant capital investment to build one of these. Yeah. Aren't they still got any of those running loose now? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> like uh, you know their descendants. Um, I've seen like one one fox on the peninsula in the last twenty years. Wow. They they grew the uh, silver, so this this black. Uh, well, you saw the pictures of uh, Mickey Williamson with her black fox on her around her neck. They're they're called the it's a, called the silver phase. Mm. Um, they're, they're red foxes, but they just have uh, the dark coats. A single pelt in the twenties, like uh, late twenties, was selling for it was astronomical. Yeah, um, hundreds remember, of dollars. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, it was it was kind of like a seven hundred. Oh yeah. Oh more than yeah, yeah. twelve hundred. Yeah. Oh. And these farmers, it was kind of like the the crazes for uh, llamas and alpacas and ostriches and things. They they'd start a farm and then they could make even way more money selling the the breeding pairs of foxes, oh. and they would ship them out all over the U.S. And, uh, you see these. Like so many of the boom and bust things yeah. when the. Uh, <coughs> When the economy crashed in 1930, then the fur market went with it pretty much. Was it a fox farm Yeah, that was rare because they're pretty skittish. But I think this is Hardy's Fox Farm. I think this is that uh, the house, the log house, that's still down at Old Kasilov Landing, and their their this looks like their pens. And they were taking pictures of moose, just like we do. <laughs> <laughs> That's Al Hardy, um, who had built that built that cabin. He's up on the lake. He was a game warden, um, off and on. Whoa. And uh, yeah, so this was an illegal. But that was a quite a hard job then. They shot it for That's what it says. Isn't that a beautiful boat? A beautiful dog. <laughs> yeah, beautiful. So that would be a wood boat, right? A what? A wood boat, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah this planks. Yep. It's a Gen Z. Employee exposed. Same moose. Good to see you. Now, Marty. Every now and then, she goes to that Orphan Moose and just fostered it. He, um, Did he read that oh, I doubt it. So this was, um, Al moved down here with his wife Alice from Anchorage. Um, he had, I uh, don't know how long they'd been there, but uh, they started the Fox Farm. Um, they just were having a, a wonderful time here. And this man started the, Ala the Kisila phone system where they uh, ran um, phone lines from tree to tree to is that all the, the same one that started the one in Soldatman? Nope. No. Nope. This is in the uh, late twenties. He, he was getting pretty old. I hadn't seen him in a couple of years. Uh, and he he was just a wonderful community man. He and um, and uh, another guy were heading up river in a skiff. Oh, so porcupines was something that they'd feed the foxes. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, they were headed up river with a load of gear to take up to a hunting camp on Tusmina. And they spotted a porcupine on the shore, and they popped in to, to get it. And when they got back in the skiff, they uh, got swept under a sweeper. Oh. And uh, both men got, uh, I don't know if the skiff overturned, but both men ended up in the water. And Al, they think he might have hit his head or something, but he drowned. In 1930, and it was a um, terrible loss to the community. Wow! So you see that right place holding there? It's a Model 95 Winchester. I bought one back in the 1990s from a guy here in Sealock. There's a mark across the buttstock just like that. And I just sold it at a gun broker about two weeks ago. <laughs> I could see that one. So is that mark unusual? You could have got more for it if you had that picture. I could have brought it here. <laughs> is that mark unusual? Yeah, you That's think because he had a like a rubber butt pad slipped over the bun stock. Oh. And left the stain on it. I bet it was the same one. It very well could be. How many Model 95 Winchesters were around wow. here back then? Oh, how many? Tell the person that bought it. 
Maybe the history. I'll send him an email. <laughs> In the 30s and 40s, there was a, a tradition of, of, of parties down by the cannery, down on the beach, 4th of July parties. And this is, is that, what? Is that a keg of whiskey? Oh, uh, well, you know, everybody homebrewed. So, quite possibly. That really hasn't changed, have it? No. <laughs> we use different kegs. What year was that last picture? Do you have any idea? Nope. Um, see the way the man is dressed with the sweater over his shirt and the slacks? I have some pictures of my family with those style clothes. 30s? Or what, what do you think? My mom was born in 35. Oh. She and I. So, the 50s. 40s? No, the, the pants are too wide for 50s. <laughs> They're playing some game here. You see this guy here? He's yeah. Got, uh, yeah. He's got a bad toothache. <laughs> or, the, or the wind's blowing dust around. <laughs> There's some other. Well, that's cool looking book. That was the, the first. That's the What's the name on that book? Ski Lang. Uh, anybody recognize these guys? Or the cabin? Two or three were, uh, um, local residents who were expert uh, log builders. Could this, anyways? Is that's, that the same draft horse we see in the I don't know. That's, that's pretty good work. Now, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you better keep that extra there, Fred. I said that. I was going to get your comment on that. Though. It was in oh, order. Oh, wow. Double double like that. Yeah. That's awesome. I mean, really Let good. the tide come in and sweep this them all away. Um, so I think this is that same post office building up oh, yeah. down the river. Mm -hmm. um, wow. And Hardy's house been, was built is up up in this area now. Mm -hmm. Time and that's up in McLean's. Yes, and there's a nice uh, chainsaw in use. <laughs> yeah. And that's Tom O'Dale's dogs up on Tuscany Lake. Doesn't that look like some, something out of Hollywood. It looked yeah. like something out of uh, the North Pole. Or yeah. Oh, wow. This is a bad photo. Uh, do we have a more better one? Uh, wow, what's that car? Okay. That's a, a, a problem with the photo. So this is oh. Al Hardy's house that um, the post office building is. So there's a, there's a steep drop off down to the river here. And his house is up on the bluff, and the post office is down, down in the draw there. And this is, this is the fox pen. Or is that? Old Casino off landing. So down, um, um, just down in the. Uh, what's the name of the road in there? For? <laughs> Sato uh, Satori. 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 Nice job. There's the pens. Cute. <coughs> There's more party. Dinner time. This <laughs> is a seal off shot. This is uh, Tom O'Dale, um, Pete Jensen, Archie McLean, Al Hardy. So this was 1930 or earlier. Um, this is John Sandwick and um, Archie's father in law. The guy almost looks like Mike Stryker. 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 James Stryker. <laughs> James Stryker, this guy at right there. Who are the women? You can't okay. Tell them so this is Jenny Sandwick. Um, I think this is um, uh, Bertha? Bertha. Bertha Stryker. Thank you. There's e Enid. These are Enid and Jetred. And Jetred. One of, um, and this is. Um, uh, Jenny, no, that's Jenny Sandwick. Um, I'm not sure who she is. And then that's. Um, yeah, we can't see her on the screen. Oh, slide your, yeah. slide your. Sorry, your, you guys. We're missing. Got moved. Oh, there oh, she is. is. She is. <laughs> wow. Fruit dresses. But most of the women back then was more today's man out there. Yeah. Are, are one of these kids Stan and Joan and uh, Stan, Stan. what was the sister's name? Jimmy. Jimmy, that would have been. Uh, Jimmy, this is Jimmy. Uh, Peterson. Jimmy Peterson. Jimmy Peterson. Jimmy Peterson. That's probably Stan. Like but the sandwich story but the Sandwicks had a little boy and a girl who died. Drowned. Uh, drowned. Uh, oh, let's not go there. Oh, so. <laughs> 
they look terribly civilized for living in the wilds of Kasila. I'm thinking mm. their dresses are awfully white. Cool. Yes. <laughs> oh, but. That was at 7 a.m. Live. Yeah, I was like, that was the beginning of the day right there. I've never shot a party <laughs> 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 I don't know how they all have hard <laughs> looks, so it'd be really good. I think we're all the same. I'm driving the horse. That's charming. I don't think they get that bad anymore than road So I'm building the Hardy cabin up in there. Oh, oh Moose, there's the, there's the post, post office. office. Moose photos. This is what uh, the Tustamina country looked like when there were no trees. <laughs> Yeah. So that, was there a fire? Oh, yes. Thank you very much. There were extensive fires. I think that's Sorry, back in my Yeah, I was just natural Yeah, most likely. Um, um, in general, they do. Uh, and it's starting to look like that again now. I was looking out, but whoever it was took good care of the stuff. Now this is a mystery. There's a couple of these photos. Is that it? No. Okay. Yeah. So um, there's some kind of party going on, and they have a gill net in the river. Oh. Oh, and I'm wondering if it's. The it's not that uncommon. <laughs> I mean, from this time period up to uh, up to civilization, about 1950, I've yeah. run across a lot of gill nets in the river. Yeah. So you can see the uh, corks here. But my theory is that this is maybe Cole's Landing um, because the, the what's now the Pollard Place is way <coughs> up above the river, but his property uh, goes down um, and hits the river, and it looks kind of like this. And I've seen on old things <coughs> references to, to Cole's Landing. So I wonder if maybe they had a dock. Up by Pollard's place with Perry Cole, is that what you're thinking? Yes, but um, but not but but so when you go down towards Fritz's, you know, mm -hmm. um, you get their property went all the way down to the river there, mm -hmm. and and they had to get all their well, they had the the road, the seven mile road, but still the the river was the main transportation, so they would have had you know a spot at the river where they had sure. a landing and. Sure, they're having a dinner and they have yet to catch the fish. Yeah. Yeah. Looks to me like a bunch of men having a contest to see who can lay it out. Yes, it's been a monster. Oh, yeah, it's an accordion. It is an accordion. It's a party. It's a party. Yeah. Either that or they're checking each other in teams to see who can put out the greatest This guy's named the accordion player. Yeah. There's a... The gas and up. Oh, with the rat. There's a white bottle. Like they're going for a moon kind. Brilliant. Yes, yes. Very early before they even get fish in the boat. There's a fish. They run out of gas. There's a fish right there. Man, this is great. <laughs> <More activity. laughs> it's amazing what you see when you have that. Oh, see what the man's doing across the river. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you see a man? I know what it's a man. That's a good one. 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 That's it said, looks like oh, okay. a dark spot <laughs> in the grass to the left of the game warden. <laughs> oh, it kind of does. There's a guy still there. Looking over his shoulder. But now there's kids in the boat. Right, let's look at all the kids. Oh, and he's got the lid back up on the gas. Yeah. They all got yeah. smiles on their faces. He's got a pipe in them, doesn't he? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, no way. Well, well, smoking in poor gas. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. Oh, my goodness. Oh, 
Okay, I think this is a good place to end. The one guy is on his knees praying that everything's good. Just running a prayer for every adventure about it. All right. Those guys are really well. Those guys are really well. They're going to take them there to, yeah. to, 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 to baptize them in the water. That's what it is. Well, uh, thank you, Catherine. Thank you for everybody for coming. Yeah. So we're going to have another uh, get-together 